Well, hello, Safe Harbor, and welcome back to our Sunday School uh, videos. Uh, we're continuing our study on the book of Genesis today, picking up and starting a kind of a new section in the book of Genesis. If you remember when we first started, I said that Genesis 1 through 11 deals with world history, the, the creation narratives, the, the kind of the foundation of civilization. You've got the flood, the Tower of Babel, the spreading of the nations, all that. And we've seen all that in the first 11 chapters. Once we get to chapter 12 and through the rest of the book, we're going to be looking at the foundations of the nation of Israel. We already saw Abraham, Abram, it's not Abraham yet, Abram, uh, be addressed in the end of chapter 11. We saw it last time. And now we're going to be focusing on him, his family, his descendants for the rest of the book. Looking at Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and then Joseph in particularly, but also all the rest of his children. With Judah, Reuben, all those people as we continue on through the rest of the book. So we'll be looking at those. Uh, and that'll be pretty much what we'll be covering for a, a number of weeks now as we get to the second half of the book. So let's pray and then we'll get into our lesson for today. God, we're thankful for this day. God, we just pray for this uh, study as we continue our study on the book of Genesis, that you just help us to learn more about you, learn more about your promises, and all that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So we saw that Abram and his family had already begun to move at the end of chapter 11. When we get pick up in chapter 12, it says, Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. And Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Then Abram took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son and all their possessions that they had gathered and the people whom they had acquired in Haran and they departed to go to the land of Canaan. So they came to the land of Canaan. So what's happening here in this passage? We see that God calls Abram for a very specific person for a specific reason. He's calling him out away from his family. We know from jo the book of Joshua, Joshua 24 mentions that Abraham's family was a pagan family, that they worshiped idols, that they did these things. And so God is calling Abram away from that lifestyle, away from his family, to begin a new movement of God. And so Abram has to make a lot of tough decisions here. He First, he has to leave his homeland. He's got to leave. The, for, he started off in Ur. We saw that last time. Now he's been to Haran, where his family is, and he's going to have to leave. Now, I don't know about you. If you've ever had to move away from your family or move away to a new place, that's a tough thing to do. You pick up everything you have. You move to a new place. Some, most of the time, you don't know people. You have no friends. You have to figure out a whole new living situation, new house, new everything. That's a bit of a challenge, especially in the ancient world where, well, as we'll see through the story, Abraham doesn't even own land. He's just kind of a nomadic tribesman who's kind of going through this land of Canaan with his, with his servants and with his family. He also has to leave his father's house. That's a big deal, and especially in the ancient culture where family clan units were where everything was. We'll see Abraham is living during a time where there's not national identities. Abram just picks up and moves to Canaan. He doesn't move to another country, so to speak. Uh, Canaan at this time was just kind of like the Wild West. Everyone just kind of did their own thing. They had certain cities that c controlled certain regions. But for the most part, it was just he's moving to a place without any connections. He's giving up his inheritance that he would have gotten from his father. He's giving up all his family ties that he's going to have. In fact, he's never going to go back to Haran. We'll see later in when we get much further down the road into chapter 24, that he'll send his servant to get a bride for Isaac from that region. And then Jacob, his grandson, 
will end up back in that region, but Abraham himself will never go back to that region. And so that he's he's really cutting all ties, if you will, in order to follow after God. But we also see that in this passage, God is forming what we call the Abrahamic covenant. He is telling Abraham that he is going to make a covenant with him. Now there are five covenants in the Old Testament. There's the Noahic covenant that we saw in chapters 8 and 9, where God promised he would never flood the earth again. He would never destroy mankind in that way. We're here at the Abrahamic covenant. Then there's the Mosaic covenant from Exodus, the Davidic covenant from 2 Samuel 7, and then the new covenant that shows up both in Jeremiah 31 and Ezekiel 34. And so these are all covenants. These are agreements that God makes between God and mankind. Think of it like a business transaction that God is telling Abraham, I will do these things for you if you remain faithful to me. Now, Abraham is in what we call a unconditional covenant. Meaning that God tells Abraham, and we'll talk about this a little bit more in chapter 15, that he's going to do this for Abraham. Abraham doesn't have to uh, do anything necessarily to earn this covenant, that God is doing this for him. The Mosaic covenant and the Mosaic law is very different. It is very much a conditional covenant where God tells the Israelites, you do this and you get this. You don't do this and you don't get this, that kind of thing. So when you think of an unconditional covenant, think of it like somebody is giving you something and you're just agreeing to take it. For example, you know, you get an inheritance from somebody. Uh, they say, hey, I'm going to give you this money. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to do anything for it. it is, you just have to receive this thing that I'm giving you. And that's what God is telling Abraham. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to do this for you. Very different than when someone says, hey, I'm going to make a trade with you, essentially. A conditional covenant is kind of like a trade. You give me this, I give you that. You work for me for X amount of years, I give you X amount of money. You trade me six camels, I'll give you five donkeys, something like that. That's more of a conditional covenant. This is an unconditional covenant. And it has three parts. As we see, he says, I will make you a great nation. Now we'll see in this text that that's a bit of a challenge for Abraham because Abraham doesn't have any children at this point. And he is 75 years old, as we saw in the passage. Sarah, his wife, is 65 years old. So that's a little bit after having childbearing and that kind of thing. So that's going to be a challenge that we're going to see show up time and time again for about the next 10 chapters in the story. But he's going to make him a great nation. And we know that nation is the nation of Israel from the Old Testament. He says, I will bless you and make your name great. Well, think about it. We are talking about Abraham. Abraham's living about 2000 BC or roughly. We're talking about Abraham 4,000 years later. Abraham is a, a, a significant figure in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So the three major monotheistic religions all talk about Abraham. He's all seen as this major player in all three of those religions literally probably four to five billion people throughout the planet know who Abraham is throughout these and then he says and you shall be a blessing I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed now what's he talking about here now talk about this in kind of two ways one through his descendants Israel will come about Israel in the Old Testament is a nation who is supposed to follow after God and is supposed to be a blessing to the world. Sometimes they do it, sometimes they don't. But ultimately, from the line of Abraham comes Jesus himself. Which is why when the New Testament opens in the Gospel of Matthew, what does it say? This is the son of Abraham, son of David, connecting him back to the Davidic Covenant, and ultimately the Abrahamic Covenant. That God was starting this line, and through this line, through this Jewish line, he was going to bless the world through that 
thing by sending his own son and by sending the Messiah through that line. And so kind of three aspects to this covenant. Now we'll see there's some other things that get clarified later. Another thing is the idea of the land that God promises Abraham not only will he have a great nation, but that nation will have their own place to live, the promised land. And so that will become a bit of a challenge as we go through as well, because the, as I said, the, the Jewish people during this time do not have their own land, which is the whole reason for the exodus in the book of Exodus and the conquest in Joshua is fulfilling that part of the Abrahamic covenant. So Abraham, he has to do that. He has to make this deal. He has to say, am I willing to trust God? Am I willing to leave my family, to leave my land, to do all this stuff, to move to a land that I've never been to in order to do this? And all we see, we don't really get a, we don't really get a, 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 a picture in the passage of what Abraham was thinking. It just, we just hear, see his actions in verse 4. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him. He just says, you know what, God, I don't, I'm not sure how, what exactly I'm going to have to do. I'm not exactly sure how this is going to work, but I'm going to follow and listen to what you have me to do. I'm going to trust you by faith that this is exactly, that you know what you're doing. This is exactly what you have called me to do. And he leaves his family, leaves his land, does all this, and moves down to Canaan. And he takes two people with him, specifically. He takes his wife, Sarah, who we find out later in the story is barren. He can't have children at this point. And he also takes his nephew, Lot, with him. We don't know why. It doesn't say in the text. But we'll see Lot show up time and again here in the next couple chapters. And, and some positive ways and some negative ways. But uh, it could be that Abraham was taking Lot with him, thinking, I don't have any kids. He's my nephew. He's going to kind of be my only connection to the next generation. That's certainly possible. Or it could have just been, hey, I'm following after God. I want this guy to become uh, part of my spiritual family. We don't know exactly. We don't know if Lot's parents had died and he was kind of his guardian or, or what exactly happened in the situation. But regardless... He takes Lot with him, and we'll see Lot show up from time to time as well. It says Abraham in, in verse 6, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem as far as the terebinth tree of Morah, and the Canaanites were then in the land. Now Shechem, we're going to see, shows up time and time again in the story of Abraham and his descendants in the book of Genesis. It shows up a lot more throughout the Old Testament. Shechem, I'm actually uh, presenting a, or attempting to present a paper on this at, at, a, at a conference here in a few months. Shechem kind of serves as a, a marker for spirituality in the Old Testament. Abraham gets the promise of God, the covenant of God here at Shechem. But we're going to see Shechem show up again in chapters 34, 35, and 36 as a very pagan, idolatrous, terrible city. And then ultimately Joseph is going to be buried at Shechem when they conquer the promised land. And they get they do a covenant renewal at Shechem. And it just shows up time and time again. It's one of those places in the Old Testament that they keep going back to. But that's where Abraham is at when he gets this thing, this meeting with God. Then, a Lord, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give you this land. So here's the land part of this covenant. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. And he moved from there to the mountains east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord. So Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. And so we see Abram, he, everywhere he goes, he's, he's worshiping God, he's building altars, but he doesn't have a homeland. He's basically what we would today call a nomad. He doesn't have a, a permanent place to live. He's just kind of a wandering herdsman. Now we'll see this plays a big role when we get to the next chapter next time when we look at that in chapter 13. But this was common in the ancient world. Uh, we, we don't think of that today. Now today, you, you don't just walk around in the backyard and, and go from backyard to backyard with your sheep or whatever. And, uh, and you usually have a permanent residence. And we will see eventually that the Israelites kind of get that later in the book. But 
For now, Abraham does not have his own land. He is a nomad. And, and it's common, we, if you look back in some of the ancient records from this time period that we have been able to dig up and find, this was very common for their society. That they, This was just how it worked in the ancient world because not everyone has houses and buildings. They're living in tents. They're covering their sheep, etc. It also says that uh, he built an altar to the Lord. And he called on the name of the Lord. And so you get this idea of he's, he's worshiping God. He is living a godly lifestyle. He's calling on the name of the Lord. It tie, ties back to uh, Seth's descendants where they were calling on the name of the Lord before the flood. It's kind of this showing that Abraham is being faithful, doing what God has called him to do at this point. But as the story continues in chapter 12, Abraham is going to make a big mistake. And that's one of the things that's very interesting about the Old Testament is it doesn't hide the mistakes of the patriarchs and of the founders of our, of our great faith. It tells us when Abraham makes a mistake. It tells us when Moses makes mistakes. It tells us when David makes mistakes. It doesn't gloss everything over. It doesn't try to make it seem like these people were perfect. No, it tells us exactly what happened. So that I think in, in part so that we know, hey, when we make mistakes, guess what? They made mistakes too. And God was able to forgive them. God can forgive us. So what happens in the story? In verse 10, now there was a famine in the land. Now, for us, we may hear that and we might go, all right, no big deal, famine. Okay, we got it. But in the ancient world, famine was a terrible thing to hear about. Remember, they can't go to Walmart. They can't go to McDonald's. There's no place to go into the grocery store to get food. Basically, they are growing their own food as they go and eating off their own land and that kind of thing, or they're trading with other individuals who are doing that. So if a famine comes through the land, guess what? Nobody eats. Nobody has any food. We'll see another famine show up later in Genesis that becomes a big deal in the story of Joseph. But famines were terrible. People would die. The whole populations would have to either move or die in these kind of famines. So a famine comes into the land. So that means Abraham is either going to have to figure out how is he going to get supplies, or he's going to have to temporarily move someplace else. It says, And Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. Now there is some debate on is he leaving the promises of God by leaving the land, or is this okay? I think his temporary moving to Egypt is not the problem. What he does when he's down in Egypt becomes the problem. But I think him, him temporarily leaving the promised land to go down to Egypt to survive the famine, I don't think that itself was sin. There's nothing in the text that hints at that. The problem is when he gets down to Egypt, he doesn't trust God. It says, And it came to pass, when he was close to entering Egypt, that he said to Sarah, his wife, Indeed, know that you are a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you are my sister, that it may be well with me for your sake, and that I may live because of you. So he immediately says, all right, we're going to kind of have a problem here. Now remember, one of the challenges to, as, as a modern reader, we read the text and we go, Abraham's like over 75 years old at this point. Sarah's over 65 years old. Like, how, why, why is Abraham worried someone's going to steal his wife? That seems kind of strange to us. But remember, this is a different culture, different things, so it could have been different for that. But the big problem is Abraham's like, Sarah, you are way too more. He, he's like, I kind of outkick my coverage. You are way too beautiful for me. Uh, I'm going to get down. We're going to get down to Egypt, and somebody is going to kill me to take you as their wife. So we got to come up with a story. He's not trusting God. God has already told him, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you a descendants. I'm going to do all this stuff. He should have just trusted God and said, All right, God's going to protect us. God's made these promises to us. Instead, Abraham decides, all right, I'm going to have to kind of fix this myself. And that's kind of Abram and Sarah's big problem throughout the book of Genesis, is they're constantly trying to 
help God along, if you will, in the story. And we do the same kind of things in our own lives. We, yeah, God, I understand you want us to do this, but uh, I think I just kind of help you along in this region or help you along in this deal. And unfortunately, that's what happens. And so he tells Sarah, hey, just tell everybody you're my sister. Now, technically, this is only a, a half-truth because Sarah was Abraham's half-sister. If you go back and look at the, at the genealogies in chapter 11. I know it sounds a little gross to us. We don't marry our sisters. We don't marry our cousins, that kind of stuff. But remember, this is very early in humanity. The gene pool hadn't been corrupted yet. People were still marrying their sisters and their relatives and these kinds of things. At this time, it wasn't really viewed as a negative uh, until much later. And so Abraham says, just tell everybody your sister. Don't tell everyone that we're married. That's the problem. It's not that, he, that she's his sister. It's that he's hiding the fact that he's married to her. And he's lying about this. Verse 14. So it was when Abram came to Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was very beautiful. The princes of Pharaoh also saw her and commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abram well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys, and camels. And so... I don't want to sound weird in this story, but essentially what's happening in the story is uh, in some ways Abraham is kind of pimping his wife out here. He's like, hey, you go and live with Pharaoh, and I'm going to get a bunch of stuff from Pharaoh. I mean, that's what's in the Bible. I'm, I'm just saying what's in the Bible. It's, it's not a good look for Abraham. He doesn't ask Sarah if she'll, I mean, we don't know what Sarah was thinking about this. It doesn't say in the text, but he does this. He's not trusting God, and in case he's lying to Pharaoh, he's covering these things up. He's not acting like a blessing to the nations. Instead, he's acting like one of the pagans. He's acting kind of like he doesn't trust God. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. Now, why would God do this? Well, two reasons. One... God is protecting Abraham because, let's face it, if Abram's going to have a great nation, Abram's a male, he kind of needs a spouse in order to do that. If Sarah ends up as part of Pharaoh's harem and Abraham doesn't have a wife anymore, it's going to be physically impossible for Abram to have, have descendants without his wife. And so God is protecting them in this situation. He's also punishing Pharaoh for taking a married woman. Now, Pharaoh doesn't know that she's a married woman because Abraham has lied in this situation, which is going to create some tension in the story. But God does not like people taking other people's wives. It's, it, the, remember, God is the one who established marriage, set that up in the Garden of Eden, continues that through, and so God takes that very seriously. And Pharaoh called Abram, and says, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? I might have taken her as my wife. Now, therefore, here's your wife. Take her and go your way. So Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. And so Pharaoh gets mad. Now, we don't understand how Pharaoh figures out that Sarah is his wife. I guess maybe Sarah lets it slip. Maybe somebody figures this out. Maybe God came and speaks to Pharaoh. We're going to see later in, in the Abimelech story in chapter 20 that that's what God does uh, in a very similar situation. We don't know how Pharaoh figured out that she was married, but it's obviously he figures this out, and he figures out this is why they're getting judgment poured out on them, that, that plagues are coming down on them. Uh, it sounds almost like the Exodus where these plagues are coming down on him. And so Pharaoh then goes to Abram and he's like, dude, why didn't you just tell me that she was your wife? Like, do you, you're you trying to come down here and you're trying to interact with us and you don't trust that we wouldn't just like respect that she's your wife and we wouldn't try to kill you? Pharaoh's kind of greatly offended by this and rightfully so. He's like, we're, we're not that bad. We're not just going to murder you to steal Sarah. Like, we would have just respected you if you had just done this. But because you have done this, instead of being a, remember, we saw in the Abrahamic covenant, Abraham was supposed to be a blessing to the nations. 
Instead of that, he's got in this story becoming a curse to the nations. They're like, you're, you're bringing curses and plagues down on us. Why, why, why did you do this? And so he just kind of sends him away. He's like, just get out of here. We don't want you. And so Abraham loses his ability to be a witness to the Pharaoh because of this, because of his own sin. And so this kind of gives us a hint that sometimes if we're not careful, if we allow sin into our lives, if we lie to people, if we misuse people, that can cut, slam the doors of evangelism right in our face. Sometimes we go, well, I, I tried to talk to someone about Jesus, but they didn't want to listen. Well, maybe they don't want to listen because they've seen our actions in our own lives. And they say, well, why would I listen to you? you you're, you're no better than me. You're lying and cheating and doing everything else. Why would I do that? And so we have to be very careful that we don't cross, that we live a pure life that allows us to be a witness to others. Now, there's always going to be people who pick little things out and call us hypocrites and these kind of things and and there's nothing we can do about that sometimes but we need to be living lives that are pure lives that are faithful to God so that he can allow us to be a witness for him can use us in these things and so Abraham blows it he could have been a great witness to Pharaoh to, sh to, to share the good news about God with Pharaoh and instead he blows it and he's sent away into back to Canaan kind of with his tail between his legs like hey you, you, you had this chance I was going to bless you and now you're out of here. And so we'll pick up in the, with the story in chapter 13 when he gets back to the promised land. And we'll see that in chapters 13 and 14 uh, next time. But let's pray and then we'll wrap up for today. God, we're thankful for this day. God, we're thankful that you have given us this Abrahamic covenant. That we know from the New Testament that we are a part of that covenant through the spiritual uh, descendants of Abraham. God, and that you will use us to bless the world. You've used Jesus himself to come as a blessing to the nations, God. We're thankful for that. We're thankful for your word. And we just pray that we'll be able to continue to learn more about you through this study of the book of Genesis. In Jesus' name, amen.